All right, everyone. Welcome to the STOA. Um, very happy for this session because we're going to have a, a conversation on the bestiary of the Anthropocene, uh, this wonderful little uh, book, which is a collaboration with uh, Nicholas, Nicholas Nova and disnovation.org, which is uh, Maria um, Rush. Uh, Skowska, uh, if I'm pronouncing your name, <laughs> please correct, and uh, Nicholas uh, May Gray. Um, and this is a kind of a bestiary that has things from lab rats, surveillance, robot dogs, plastic eating cow, uh, caterpillars, and then uh, COVID-19. Uh, and it shows basically all the hybrid creatures that are uh, existing on our damaged planet. And how today's going to work, uh, our three guests are going to have a, a presentation for about 30 minutes, and then we'll pivot to uh, Q&A. If you have any questions, just put it in the chat anytime. I'll call on you. You can unmute yourself and ask your questions uh, to the guests. If you don't want to be on YouTube, because this will be on YouTube, just indicate that in um, the chat, and I'll read your question on your behalf. So that being said, uh, Maria and both Nicholas's, welcome to the STOA. I, I don't know. Yeah. Thanks. We are Thank pretty you. happy to be here. Um, that's very um, nice to share this with a North America audience as well. And, um, uh, I guess it's also for us a sort of uh, one of the few events that, where we can release this book and share a little bit of the process behind it. Um, so I think we will start a few slides and maybe uh, Nicolas can say a few words during the technical process. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, the the, the book it, it, it has been released in. The, I think it was, it was in the U.S. in April, but it's kind of a long, long project for us. Uh, the book was started from a different series of exhibits, and and it's. Uh, I mean, it was published around the beginning of the of the year, so it's it's funny for us to reiterate this never-ending uh, release. Uh, but what we'll try to uh, do in the, um, the coming like, minutes is to give you some kind of like summary of the motivation for, uh, for the book. And then we'll go through certain, some of the uh, uh, specimens of those uh, hybrids between nature and, and, and the artificial. So probably can yeah. go back to Nicola. Great. Um, yeah, so I guess, um, so Maria and I are part of a, more like an art collective uh, where we are sort of critically investigating the issues around, uh, you know, like the innovation as a sort of propaganda and all the rhetorics of technosolutionism and innovation is uh, sort of shaping our value systems and we are in investigating those uh, fields and ideas uh, with artworks and stuff like that. And um, from time to time, we also work on books projects. So I guess um, six years ago, we worked on this book called uh, the, the Pirate Book, where we were investigating sort of uh, the culture of media piracy in different places of the globe. And um, since uh, more or less uh, a year after we released the, the Pirate Book, we started uh, yeah, sort of uh, jamming and uh, chatting around uh, the, the idea of uh, this bestiary with uh, Nikola Nova. And that, um, that's a little bit of how the project started and we'll come back to it after and explain a little bit of the, the process. So the, the, the book, to, I mean, just to say in a few words, uh, <clears throat> that's something in between a sort of uh, a compilation book that uh, brings together uh, about uh, 60 uh, specimens uh, that are not uh, exhaustive uh, <laughs> overview of uh, what's the, what the Anthropocene uh, brings about, but uh, more like uh, cherry picking in the sense that we, we, we try to, to take uh, specimens in uh, different uh, categories of what could be um, the visible uh, part of the changes and the consequences, direct and indirect, of uh, uh, the Anthropocene. And what we mean by <clears throat> this uh, neologism is, uh, I mean, sometimes named as the capitalocene. It means basically uh, the changes that are brought about uh, by man-made uh, artifacts, but also by uh, 
the impact of the uh, capitalism and uh, fossil fuel as a force that uh, did accelerate uh, modernity and uh, changes in the sense that the changes we will talk about in those different levels of consequences we will uh, uh, be uh, explaining and uh, describing are not only the, the effect of the um, direct uh, you know human-made impact but also this incredible acceleration of human-made impacts uh, thanks to uh, fossil fuels that uh, has uh, enormously um, uh, enlarged and uh, accelerated uh, the ability of humans to affect and change and shape uh, their environment and the, the world around them. So, I mean, just as a kind of general framing. Um, and I guess maybe Nicolas have some stuff to say about how the, the, the project sort of took shape and how we interacted together and stuff like that. Yeah, the, I mean, based on what Nicolas just, just mentioned, it's funny to have two, two authors named Nicolas, so it's, uh, sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> but but um, what, we, what we tried to do is to um, go from the, the documents or the field research we could do. I'm, I'm an anthropologist uh, myself, interested in technologies, but also the relationship between human being and their environment. So I, I guess what we tried to do is to combine this kind of interest uh, for the field, this kind of empirical interest in noticing specific uh, specimens and contrast that to documents that exist about those different uh, hybrids. And we spent like few, few months, few years, because it's a project that lasted like almost six years. We spent all this time like uh, collecting examples of uh, creatures, specimen, it's hard to uh, pin down or to find a proper name for, for, for this, but examples of this kind of hybridization between the natural and the artificial. And we tried to uh, consider like in nature is a problematic term, but we tried to consider uh, uh, animals uh, like vegetables or uh, also the um, the geological uh, component of the of this uh, of this planet, and also try to understand whether uh, artificial specimens would not fit into these nicely uh, shaped uh, categories. And over time, I mean, we we have a lot of material, but we had to to uh, find a a way to um, have a decent number for 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 the book. So it's probably as as Nicola would mention before, the idea was not to have something exhaustive, but try to find a, a certain number of um, specimens that would illustrate uh, some problems some issues about the Anthropocene and try to find a certain balance between uh, having like too much animal or too too, too much uh, 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 rocks or uh, rock shaped. Uh, 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 structures. And what, what we did also, and probably Maya will comment on that later, was to find uh, a, a, a format that would be interesting for, for this. Uh, here it's called a best theory of the Anthropocene, but we came up with this title a bit late in the process. Uh, but the term best theory was important for us. And I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, term, but it, it, it existed in the Middle Ages in, uh, in, in Europe. It started as a sort of a evolution of the uh, Christian uh, theology as a way to do some kind of, well, natural uh, research or naturalist research about the environment. And, and best theories were books in which um, animals were described uh, with plenty of visuals, but also text that would uh, describe the characteristic and the behavior of the animals, but also some kind of moral uh, like uh, values about it, about some, 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 some problems that some uh, uh, animals would uh, illustrate. And, and of course you had like uh, real creatures and also some more uh, fictional ones like dragons or unicorns, and we thought it would be interesting to use that kind of metaphor of the sort of pre-modern uh, representation of, of nature and combine that with something a bit more modern or scientific with this kind of, uh, well, we'll see that a bit later, but the, the, the description of the animals with visuals, with uh, captions and text. And it was a way for, for us to find the right balance between the way nature can be described and the way uh, like these kind of weird specimens of 
for instance, here of plastic and rocks combined could be illustrated uh, with this kind of visual language and a short text that described quite the, a quite flat description of what is this specimen and some of its consequences. So probably Maria can follow up on this on the, the, the visual and design choices, I guess. Yeah, sure. Um, I can add some, uh, some aspect about uh, the context uh, on our side with this innovation as we are often uh, trying to find uh, underreported stories and uh, uh, changes in society uh, related to technology. So we are often like uh, working on this topic and uh, um, so for us, uh, we, we start to work on the publication when you find that there is a subject in, that should be more present in the discussion, or uh, even if they are present, the, some important societal topics, well, even if they are present, they are more like uh, the shape of academic papers and uh, theory books, um, which is good, but uh, can be a bit standardized. So. Um, we were interested in developing um, a form of uh, different form of publication, like kind of uh, formed between an art exhibition and theory and research, it was kind of a strange uh, hybrid as well, like with illustrations and uh, with a kind of very factual parts and uh, also like more critical uh, parts. So. Um, as Nicolas Megret uh, mentioned before, we started uh, like this research with the Pirate book five years ago. And uh, for Bestiary, we, um, our, our starting point was um, when we realized that uh, it's been a while uh, then that nature and technological hybrids are not anomalies anymore. They are uh, nor, not exceptions, they are really normalized. Uh, so, um, we thought this situation needs its own glossary, a kind of updated version of Atlas of Species, or we can imagine a kind of cloud atlas with contrails and uh, geology engineering technologies or sky atlas with satellites. So it's like this kind of, uh, this kind of approach when uh, to express this feeling that uh, this entanglement is inseparable. It's like uh, some, this, so not only intellectually, but also by accumulation of, uh, of uh, kind of symptoms and this human made, uh, made creatures that uh, after reading the book, hopefully people will start uh, noticing them a little more. So I was, uh, like Nicolas mentioned, I was working more like on the uh, graphic uh, iconography part. So, um, we we were in, we were inspired by um, biodiversity literature, so uh, especially illustration in them, which are amazing, and uh, uh, many different projects. Um, and uh, so, as you can you can see, after the book uh, is uh, made in two parts. The first part is a, a really like accumulation of facts of of hybrids. So. These illustrations are hybrid illustrations as well. So they were like photos, and then um, then they are redesigned uh, by hand, but in a te technique more like uh, raster points, but with hand, and then vectorized. So it's kind of strange, strange uh, in between uh, this uh, drawing and GIF. Uh, so you can see this kind of aspect uh, right now in the slides. And uh, for the second part, the illustrations are really like uh, strongly rasterized gifts. So, um, uh, and also illustrations are less uh, factual and more critical or symbolic. Um, for example, in the last part, there is a part, uh, a contribution by Jeffrey Boker which is uh, towards a gestalt switch, which is uh, about changing the perspective, changing the uh, way of seeing things. And we were illustrating it with uh, uh, 18th century um, a collection of illustration, uh, which is called Reversed World. We can see it in the picture right now, uh, which represents a world when the roles of animals and humans are, are reversed. So we can see the bird, which is killing a hunter and the, uh, and so on. 
So, uh, so yeah, that's uh, the book is quite uh, structured. So there's two two parts. The first really like sixty specimens and illustrations and descriptions, and the second part there are ten contribution like more observations, less factual, more critical, more reflective um, with uh, with aspects like classification, artificial ferality, uh, negative commons, so and so on. So uh, so yeah, it's like uh, I um, I think we can pass into the specimen uh, parts because I, I think we have uh, some videos to show you, but so we already over time. Expect, except you want to add something, Nicolas or Nicolas. Um, I, I guess we can jump in uh, why we will be describing the specimens. So yeah, why we wanted to, to sort of shift uh, towards this. Um, on this second part of the lecture, we wanted to just dig uh, into some of the specimens and uh, continue the conversation based on uh, factual uh, entities. Um, <clears throat> maybe the way to explain why we, we started focusing on very materialist and uh, physical entities is also because we felt that this larger phenomena of the Anthropocene has been so much discussed in the uh, last 15 years, uh, but it's pretty much a very uh, globalized and theoretical and sometimes a bit abstract phenomenon that uh, we mostly grasp through uh, sensors, through uh, uh, you know, scientific models, through uh, data visualization and so on. It, it feels very much intangible in so many regards, or at least a big part of this field can, can really feel like something uh, out of diagrams and uh, you know, like uh, abstract uh, plan planetary scale technological sensor system that are uh, sort of sensing for us, right? or sensing um, and being transposed into numbers and graphs and so on. So we wanted to sort of take a, another starting point and uh, harvest and investigate uh, those planetary changes uh, through very uh, much more focused approach and very materialist approach to sort of document some of the consequences and some of the artifacts that did emerge from uh, this uh, epoch of the, the Anthropocene. So we'll just uh, go with you through some of the specimens of the book. It's, they are organized in the exact same order as the book, but we just uh, selected a, a few of them. Um, so the, 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 the first one that you can see on screen is part of the first chapter, which uh, focuses on the old school uh, category, the, the kingdom of minerals. Uh, so we use the more or less the kingdom of uh, Linné, uh, which are uh, sort of ancient uh, classifications uh, for uh, organizing uh, uh, life and uh, you know like uh, uh, natural uh, entities. And uh, obviously, uh, not all of the elements we will show you are strictly. Uh, contained in those categories, they are always sort of, uh, um, I would say, uh, overlapping on many categories, uh, most of the time with uh, artificiality, technology, and so on. So this first one is the Fordite. Um, it's been um, described as also the Detroit agate. It's basically uh, an accumulation of uh, paint over time. Uh, that has been uh, produced um, in a relation with the uh, four the factories, uh, so in the area of Detroit, but not only. So the the layers of paint that will uh, flow and uh, you know like uh, uh, be uh, diffused by the intensive uh, car factory over decades and decades and decades did form sort of a surface layer of uh, paint and. Uh, like hundreds and hundreds of layers of those different color paints uh, that will accumulate on the top of the, the roads and the rock and the surface. Um, and it's at some point it's been named uh, in its own name, which is this Fordite or Detroit Agat, as a kind of hybrid new mineral that has its own shape and its own uh, 
in, in some way, it's also a, an actor in the sense that it's not only this dead matter, but this matter interacts with us. You know, it, it has, uh, thanks to the chemicals, so thanks to many other qualities of it. Uh, it's not only this uh, dead thing, it's also sort of an actor of our, um, you know, like a current uh, way of life. Um, so this entity has a, a I mean, uh, yeah, has a place in the classification uh, uh, in itself, in a way. Uh, I don't know if you want to add something, or otherwise we can... Yeah, we can go to the next one. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say that it has a certain aesthetic as well, which proves the fact that these hybrids between artificial and, and natural, they, I mean, most of them are kind of problematic, but does not mean that they don't have a certain aesthetic that people can, uh, can value culturally speaking. Yeah, you're very right in the sense that uh, those uh, four diet are uh, basically uh, collected and uh, transformed into a uh, very fancy and expensive uh, jewelry. So they can be refined and polished and shaped and uh, become very interesting and uh, weird looking uh, uh, jewelry elements. And pretty similar to that is the plastigomerate. So <clears throat> it's also a neologism uh, that is uh, this kind of um, encounter uh, between uh, plastic objects, microplastics, and uh, lava and minerals, and all that digested by the, the sea and, um, uh, let's say, by the ecosystems in a way. Uh, and becomes this kind of uh, mashup uh, that is uh, not anymore plastic, not anymore rocks or uh, minerals. It's sort of uh, an accumulation that has its own status. Uh, in terms of quantity, it seems like most of those specimens of plastigomerate are composed of fishing nets, uh, but still you can find a, a wide diversity of uh, um, yeah, different uh, shapes and types, typologies of those uh, hybrids. Anything you want to add? Okay, I let you jump on the next one, maybe then. <laughs> so the next, uh, the next one is uh, well, chicken bones. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but. A uh, geologist interested in the uh, Anthropocene, uh, working on what is called stratigraphy, meaning trying to understand whether there's a certain kind of signature of geological activity uh, on uh, the planet so that they could trace it and date it. They, uh, they discussed the fact that chicken bones could be one of the stratigraphic signature of our uh, or society on this on this planet, which which is related to the fact that chicken uh, evolved uh, over time, mostly because we domesticated these uh, creatures and we eat them in some so big quantities that it becomes so important on this planet that the bones that remains uh, out of the, our consumption of, of chicken can form a layer on this planet. So that's. Uh, that's for us that that's also an interesting case, not to signal the fact that uh, rocks like plastic glomerates or fordite are part of the Anthropocene, but there's also like this kind of, uh, I mean, they used to be living, uh, living beings, this, this, this kind of food, the, our food system has a, a very important uh, influence on, on geology and the, I mean, Especially when you when you see this kind of KFC like uh, bucket with, uh, with with chicken nuggets of, of, of chicken, it's 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 I mean it's exactly what Nicola mentioned a few minutes ago. That's a way to grasp the concept of the Anthropocene, which could be pretty abstract, but here we can totally relate to these things that we can see in everyday life. And and our point here is to show that there's this kind of continuity between our behavior and some kind of geological force that, that is, of course, stunning, as you can, uh, as you can imagine. Yeah, and I guess now we we'll, uh, also change the, the scales of what we describe and, and jump into the, uh, another category somehow. 
decapitated mountain tops or mountain tops uh, removal, uh, which is, I mean, mostly a practice of uh, extractivism, like uh, to, to extract uh, uh, minerals um, and uh, fossils. And uh, so um, that's, uh, that's a sample. Of, uh, 500 mountains have already disappeared along with the habitats for hundreds of species. And lives are impacted too. When a mining company carves off a mountaintop, it has to put that earth somewhere. And so, it dumps it into nearby valleys. 3,200 local streams have been destroyed. And entire communities have been forced to relocate when the mining companies buy up the land. Yeah, we just wanted to show the, that as a, <clears throat> I mean, just to see that even if those examples are physical and material, uh, they, I mean, they can articulate on very different uh, scales. And I mean, they are not less uh, human made, uh, but sort of the result of different uh, scales of the I mean, politics and the actors. Um, the same kind, it's a bit more maybe um, superficial or uh, funny in a way, but uh, artificial mountains are also sort of coexisting with, with us and they are part of, I mean, you will see it in a couple of our specimens, uh, they, 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 they slowly bent into more artificial than actually natural, they are more in sort of the faking or replicating. Um, there is a small clip in Nicolas, I don't know, or Maya, if you want to um, add something <laughs> onto it. Well, probably the artificial mountain is, is important to, to consider the fact that uh, the, the diversity of, of shape around us is also uh, a product of this kind of hybridization. And we tend to forget the existence of this kind of artificial mountain, but wherever, I mean, you go to a theme park or sometimes you, I mean, I live in Switzerland where you have a lot of tunnels and every time there's a big tunnel, there's next to it, there is obviously generally some kind of artificial mountain that was produced with the remnant of the, of the tunnel. So that's also a, a way to remind us of this sort of uh, presence of certain human activity by big uh, companies or states to be a geological shape somehow. Yeah, and you can find also this kind of uh, fake uh, infrastructure more and more to disguise uh, uh, communication infrastructure. So we come back to it later, but uh, there are more and more uh, shapes that replicates uh, natural things uh, to hide uh, antennas and data centers and you know like uh, a telecommunication infrastructure that people don't really maybe want to see uh, in their raw shape so they are disguised in a way um, another entity uh, is the trinitite um, i know nicolas do you want to say something about it? Well, this one is, uh, I mean, it's probably you know it as the sort of radioactive or sort of byproduct of nuclear bomb uh, testing that, that was quite common at a certain point in time and which created this kind of, uh, I mean, kind of geological formation that is basically sand melted by the, the, the blast of, uh, of the atomic bomb. and. And it also has, I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit like for that. It, it, we have, we have we realized that, that there's some kind of strange aesthetic uh, character of this, this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, rock. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's also, I mean, it's this kind of strange kind of uh, rock or specimen that we have that we can, I mean, it can look uh, almost as a, as a natural as a natural one, can do as as pretty as a natural rock. But then, if you know the story, of course, there's this this presence of the of the atomic blast that that is except encapsulated in the uh, in the uh, object itself, and then it's quite quite scary. I have to uh, I have to say. 
But here it's an interesting case of another like, gigantic uh, kind of uh, uh, phenomena that, that happened in the last uh, 100 years or so. So the next one is uh, important for us because it's among the, the first specimens that uh, uh, we brought on the table to, to start the discussion around the book. Uh, it was, I guess, on, among maybe the, the first 15 uh, specimens or something. So it's those uh, coastal uh, tetrapods. Um, they are like uh, uh, concrete infrastructures that are uh, designed to uh, uh, break uh, the, the force of the waves on the, on the seaside. Uh, they are, um, I mean, enormous uh, uh, artificial shapes uh, that uh, sort of restructure uh, the, um, the seaside in many uh, places uh, around the globe. So here you just see sort of uh, an infotainment uh, from one of the company that uh, produced them. <clears throat> you can see uh, all their shape and uh, all this sort of rearrange new uh, landscapes in a way and uh, for some I mean if any of you uh, grew up next to a, a seaside they I mean if you, if you saw that for the, the last four years they, they, they become al almost like part of the your experience of the natural in a way or your experience of the normalized landscape uh, but they are I mean, pretty strong uh, artificial um, um, uh, sort of uh, um, intervention. Anything you want to add, Nikos? Do you want to talk about the next one, uh, Maria? Or, or Nico? I don't know. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I guess artificial reef, uh, well, I mean, you know that uh, uh, human made. Uh, uh, you know, chemicals and uh, the, the change in acidity of the oceans and so on are damaging uh, uh, natural reefs. Uh, and uh, there is sort of a trend of uh, reintegrating uh, artificial uh, structures and artificial uh, almost uh, uh, elements and sculptural uh, blocks um, deep in the sea as a sort of uh, habitat uh, to restore and restart um, some uh, process of, uh, you know, like um, diversity and uh, aggregation of uh, 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 sea vegetals and um, animals and so on. So sort of uh, as, a, as a framework for new habitats. And there is this weird uh, trend also to uh, just uh, uh, use those, uh, I mean, use uh, discarded uh, infrastructures and uh, discarded um, metal uh, uh, planes and uh, uh, trucks and uh, wagons and whatever, uh, dump them into the sea and consider them as those potential artificial reefs. So that, that's the, the short video clip I will show you where they sort of uh, explain how all the discarded uh, subway cars are uh, uh, just dumped into the, the sea. Uh, next to New York as a sort of uh, new habitat for uh, damaged uh, reefs uh, around there. Cape May, New Jersey to form an artificial reef. Environmental officials hope will someday be packed with fish. For the men who do this dangerous salvage work miles offshore, the work isn't easy. You can feel, you can feel the machine when the barge is moving around. You can feel the machine lean over a little. So it gets a little scary at times. Yeah. Today's work added another 30 cars to a reef that will ultimately be the underwater home of more than 600 MTA retirees. Okay, um, uh, Nicola and Maria, feel free to tell me if uh, you want to directly jump to something further. Uh, so I had the, the rock shaped speaker as a, something prepared. <laughs> so I mean, that's more like a, a easy and uh, you know, 
light example, but um, it's part of when technology also tries to uh, camouflage um, for many reasons, you know, it can be just for, uh, to, to, to stick and feet in the landscape, to, to prevent people from uh, rubbing things or to uh, dissimulate for animals and so on. So here is sort of an example where companies start to um, produce speakers that are just made to, uh, to feed and hide in plain sight uh, for parks, for around swimming pools and, and so on. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, let me see how, how many more we had and maybe we can go a bit quicker in there. Um, one, it's probably the, the antenna trees that could be uh, an interesting conclusion as a, yeah. mm -hmm. as a species. If you don't yeah, we can just understand. jump here and there. So I had that one that is um, super funny. <laughs> so yeah, let's jump here and there. So we, we had the animal decoy also, which is one of the late stage of the animal chapter, um, which is basically purely uh, artificial <laughs> animals. They are used for many reasons, uh, you know, sometimes just to sort of um, uh, scare other animals or fake uh, the presence of a predator or something. And I found this example earlier today where they are actually used to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, to catch uh, uh, poacher and people that will hunt uh, illegal animals uh, and uh, record them while doing that. So that's a fun example here. Uh, I think I have the other one. Let's see. Oops. One sec. Portable, comes in pieces, and we just put it together. It's very mobile. We can move it to different areas. We offer cash rewards for information that leads to the arrest and conviction of poachers. You know, with the old uh, full mount taxidermy, you know, it was pretty much stuck in this position. Now, you can actually, as they sit there, oh, that's not real. You know, have our friend look away, and then when they make a movement, you just come back to them. And usually that's enough to, uh, to sell them. Yeah, so that's... Um just a stage before um, the robot animals that you all uh, saw uh, again and again in the um, social media for the last uh, five or 10 years uh, with the you know, big dog and other uh, advanced uh, Boston Dynamics uh, specimens. Uh, and indeed we can jump to the antenna trees uh, so that Nicolas can say a few words about it. Yeah. The, the concealing or trying to dissimulate technology seems to be uh, important these days. And some, some countries are, uh, I mean, in some countries you can find a lot of those antenna trees, which are uh, big masts for uh, cell phone uh, coverage, but they are disguised or concealed as, as fake trees, uh, depending on uh, where you are, you can have palm trees, you can have, uh, well, alpine uh, uh, specimens of, uh, of trees. And it's, um, I mean, it's probably one of the, to me, it's one of the most striking example of how uh, the infrastructure, the technological infrastructure should be naturalized for, for some people because it's, it's too problematic to see that as, 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 as an antenna. I remember visiting a place uh, in which they told me that uh, the huge palm tree appeared in in one night, overnight, like a, a, an instant tree that, that happened. And that's probably an, an important uh, example of, uh, of the Anthropocene uh, as well. With a certain aesthetic quality, but you have three designers uh, for this. Yeah, and I just heard recently that uh, in Paris, you have uh, fake uh, chimneys. So like uh, on the top of the buildings, you have new chimneys that are built. They are just made out of wood and uh, you know, uh, wallpaper. Uh, and they are hidden uh, containers for uh, 5G antennas that people don't want to see. Uh, so one researcher here in Paris is uh, sort of uh, uh, documenting uh, those, uh, 
uh, new infrastructures as well. So I had just two more specimens that are uh, man-made clouds. Um, maybe, uh, I don't know, do you want to say something on that one perhaps? Yeah. Yeah, they, they, this, this kind of clouds are generally happen when you have huge uh, fires, the mega fires that happen in Australia or California. And you have a mix of a, a proper uh, cumulonimbus cloud with uh, the, the, I mean, what at the, the fire and the smoke of the, the fire. And it creates this huge cloud that is even more uh, dangerous and even more uh, uh, problematic for the for the environment, and that's an example of how nature and and, and man-made uh, cultural phenomena uh, intersect with sometimes the storm uh, as well. Yeah, and they are in, in themselves uh, sort of a new scale and a new category of uh, of clouds, and you have all this larger category of what's called uh, you know like human-made clouds uh, that can be composed of such. Uh, uh, mega fire clouds, but also like uh, uh, you can have all the you know like uh, uh, chemtrails and uh, contrails uh, that are also documented in the book uh, and other types of man-made clouds that you can see in the book. Um, yeah, so I guess that, I mean that's pretty much it for a short uh, thirty minutes uh, warm up, and uh, <laughs> we can maybe uh, move to an informal discussion or Q and A, whatever you want. Uh, I'm just going to stop your screen share. Um, cool. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, uh, put them in the, the chat. Uh, we'll have about 15 minutes. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the first question. I think Nicholas said it was, this project took six years uh, to create. Was there anything particularly disheartening, uh, like a specimen that you discovered that was like, oh man, that's messed. Um, and the the other uh, question I'll take with that is, is there anything that was like maybe a hybrid specimen that you came across that was kind of promising? Probably you know, the, the definition of promising is, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure you would you, would you think of that, but uh, there's one category of plastic uh, eating caterpillars. Uh, so some, some kind of, design creature that would eat uh, plastic and microplastic. And that's obviously, uh, I mean, it's both interesting and scary at the same time. It's interesting because plastic is a problem. Scary, it's also because uh, it means that it's a creature that's been genetically engineered to, uh, to do that. And as usual with this kind of technology, we're not sure about the consequences and the side effects. Uh, what happens if like every, every piece of plastic are eaten, like uh, everything that we want to keep at home. Uh, what happens if like, uh, like the digestion of the, the plastic brings something even more toxic, but at least it seems to be uh, a more, um, I mean, probably a bit more positive than the, the one, some of the, the big dog for instance, or some of the creatures we, uh, we show. Nicholas or uh, uh, Maria, any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> uh, in some ways, we did try to be not too uh, moralistic about the, the selection in the sense that, I mean, it's pretty dark, probably, okay, but uh, uh, we did try to be pretty factual about uh, the description and the contextualization of those specimens. Um, and also, I guess, in a sense, if you consider those changes, uh, they are pretty, yeah, they are, they are pretty frightening and stressful on some levels. But if you see that on the large scale, they are part of, the, I don't know, of a process of takeover, or takeover of a, a species, a species over the others. And, um, you know, like, it's, it's almost beyond the, the moral level at some point. It's like more like uh, um, that's the scale, the scale of our way of life and the scale of our the acceleration we are into at the moment and the scale of our energetical impact on the world and the scale of the materials we are uh, you know, distributing and, uh, and moving around through the, 
the clicks on our computers and our constitution patterns and so on is, is such that um, at some point um, you have multifactorial uh, changes and uh, transformation and artificialization of the world. And I guess we could say that at this point in time, uh, the artificiality is uh, everywhere. You know, like uh, I mean, it's you you can't really tell uh, what's not artificial anymore. In the sense that uh, we reach a stage in history where, uh, at different scales from different uh, perspectives, you will find artificiality in everything, like uh, at <laughs> atomic artificiality, maybe uh, uh, microplastic artificiality, maybe. Uh, microwaves artificiality i mean so in some levels there is uh, you can't really have uh, you can't really think and act with clean hands or you know like uh, you can't really think in this in the kind of moral framework anymore uh, we we are products and we live in this time of full artificiality so from from that point uh, the only way we can think and project ourselves is from this stage of artificiality <laughs> towards later stages. Uh, but there is no really, to me anymore, uh, moral standpoint in the sense of uh, going back to any previous stage or uh, differentiating different qualities or uh, prejudices of those artificiality in the sense that, you know, we, we are fully uh, we are fully uh, partaking and, and products of, of, of that. Uh, yeah, this may be a, a little bit of a, a twist on the, the question you asked. But. <laughs> yeah, you, we, we had also some um, feedbacks, interesting feedbacks. This is true, but also you had some interesting feedbacks that usually uh, the examples uh, of human uh, animal uh, collaboration, human plant collaboration, it's not a choice. It's a we are instrumentalizing the animals. It would be uh, nice to, to have more like uh, uh, hybridity or uh, collaboration, but a little more uh, like uh, not only human who is like on the part on the size, which is like imposing things like uh, more like horizontal uh, collaboration between uh, species or yeah, between plants and humans. And uh, there is one example. This is an art project. It's a pigeon blog. Uh, it's uh, but it's maybe going a bit more in this sense but then it's always uh i don't know how 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 we could install this kind of collaboration but it's it's uh it's the research we can do next time uh, i'll take a nobody special in a moment uh but my quick follow-up is you know this this book itself uh, is sort of like a a hybrid artifact it's kind of like a you know you can't really like you know, put it in one category, which is really cool. And I think that's like the, the future of, of art or at least good art. Um, and so I'm curious, what is like the promise of this particular um, artifact, hybrid artifact, if you, if you um, like that phrase, or like just that it in general, like, is it about awareness building? Is it about actuating collective potential? How do you uh, hold uh, this creation, what it, what it can do? Well, this, I mean, one of the um, the person who wrote uh, a text in the in the sort of theoretical part at the end of the book is uh, Anna Tsing, the uh, American uh, anthropologist, and she, I mean, in her book, she encouraged us to uh, she encourages us to 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 pay attention to start noticing to the art of noticing, and and probably what what we try to do with the book is uh, yeah, it's in between awareness and try to educate the way educate people to see certain things they take for granted and see this kind of uh hybridity in everyday life uh, and one could see the the book uh, i think uh nicola mentioned that uh, also one could see the book as a kind of field book that you carry with with you when you're i mean uh anywhere it could be uh it could be in the mountains it could be in the forest or it could be in your in the city and you start yeah, seeing some kind of patterns. Of course, you can see some features, but also you can see like similarities and ask questions. So it's in between awareness and trying to engage people into asking questions about things they they did not notice or they took for granted and, and, and try to understand it 
yeah, it's a bucket of, of, of uh, chicken nugget, but at the same time, it's a stratigraphic uh, marker of geology. And that I think is, is uh, I mean, it's, it's needed, right? It's, it's, as, a, as a skill, as a, as a human being uh, today. Yeah, I like that hybrid Anthropocene spotting, uh, get, get, the, get your fine-tuned artistic sensibilities there. And any um, thoughts on that, Nicholas and Maria, before I take in someone else? We can move to the next question. Okay. Uh, nobody special. You had a few questions, uh, if you can pick one. <laughs> yeah, hi. Um, I'm loving this. Um, I, I get caught on words. So uh, I started off with this word bestiary and uh, I was wondering why it wasn't bestiary uh, because the, I looked up the descriptor and it says all about beasts. Um, so um, why would they make it a best and not a beast? Uh, that was my first question in my mind. Um, and uh, then to move on to the subject of what is a beast, um, the for me, the processes of fear. Uh, so when we fear something, we don't understand it, and we and we create a condition, which is uh, a subject uh, to label it as something um, as uh, something we can't um, have spent time with, uh, and so it, it creates iconic um, label um, for this thing that we fear, um, so that we never go near it. Um, so for me, the study of the wild is to how to unwild. Um, these processes and to perhaps look at nature as our only option rather than to be scared of it. Um, so uh, the, the, the comment I had was if we know that there is sentience in a creature, um, then we have every opportunity to understand it. Um, and, and to me, that's what's largely missing in our society is that we create things like Alexa and um, my friends are in IT and they don't use Alexa anymore because it became infuriating when they had to turn down the music and yell at Alexa to turn down. Um, so we create the conditions uh, ripe for our interactions to create more hostility. Um, so uh, th these are all, you know, I love this fact that you've um, compounded a book um, to study the our ill effects on creating um, perhaps more worse conditions than we should. Um, well, so I have another question. Um, the study of moisture and our, our um, what's it called? The oceanic um, conveyor. If that is indeed um, slowing down, then perhaps we won't have as many um, populated storms, but we'll just have larger, more aggressive storms less frequently. Um, so these are my thoughts on, on how perhaps our reactionary process of trying to build up um, artificial reefs is, is ill-founded because actually maybe things are actually calming down. Um, but anyway, those, those are all my personal thoughts on this process. Yep, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, you, I mean, we have a lot to answer about this, but the book certainly address those things and probably at the more general level the term beast or the, the term that we also ran across in the context of the research is uh, monster. I mean, would, would this uh, creature specimens be considered as monsters? And of course, in the history of, of, of um, I mean, our relationship with nature, monsters uh, were creatures that we could not necessarily understand. And, and it's, there's some kind of naturalization process in the way these things which are distant are understood by human beings. We give them a name, we give them uh, a description, we try to uh, project a certain meaning on, on them, so sometimes certain sentience, and that's part of what we do, but it doesn't mean that, that this is inherently uh, good as, uh, as, uh, as you mentioned with the examples at the end. It can lead to certain side effects and consequences which are even worse than where we, where we were before. And that probably connect with, uh, there was a, a question by Kevin that it, it's probably close to, to that in the sort of power asymmetry between human beings and, and big corporations, which are largely responsible for some of those hybrids. Uh, but probably Nicola and Maya have more thoughts about the connection between glitch capitalism and, and, and this project. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously that there are some um, connections. So um, yeah, on the side of doing this book, we are also doing sort of art installations and uh, uh, um, sort of political art projects. And uh, I guess Kevin is uh, reacting to some of the projects documented on our site. Uh, one uh, sort of comment and um, intervene uh, in what has been named sometime uh, glitch capitalism is the moment when uh, advanced uh, algorithmic structure and uh, you know like most of the things around us are programmed and, and a lot of the interfaces and tools and uh, devices we use are results of programs and for those companies if you think about you know like big tech sector and so on uh, they don't put so much effort in all of those program things. Uh, at least the levels of effort they consider as enough is the level when they make more profit than uh, losses. So it doesn't mean that those algorith algorithms are good enough or it doesn't mean that they are proper. They are most of the time just good enough to uh, do the commercial work for which they have been designed or at least to, to produce some gain. So the backside of that story is that they produce a lot of glitches and they produce a lot of biases and they produce a lot of uh, unintended consequences uh, from our perspective. From the company perspectives, it's all intended uh, uh, sort of consequences in the sense that they have been poorly designed and they have been designed with not high human uh, attention. So, as a result, we live in this, in this kind of framework of what we could call a glitch capitalism. It means that it's the result of advanced stage of capitalism, but where we are surrounded with failing algorithm and failing uh, behaviors and failing, uh, uh, you know, like uh, recommendations of products and whatever. Uh, so that, that's all we, we started framing uh, uh, and investigating this field and we, we developed some projects sort of reacting to that where we are basically uh, making a counter surveillance of those big tech actors uh, to uh, extract uh, some features and some uh, uh, philosophical, political um, sort of uh, characteristic uh, for those companies. And uh, we send them back uh, recommendations uh, through social media, through emails and so on. So we kind of do a symbolic uh, uh, turnover of what is usually happening when those companies are sending, up, sending us tons of recommendations and tons of uh, sort of uh, ways to shape how we think and so on. So yeah, just to make this short, that that's the short answer to the glitch capitalism aspect. And I just want to presence that we're at the top of the hour. Um, the, do the guests have like five more minutes maybe to squeeze in one more question or yeah sure cool um kevin do you have anything to add to that though because that was your question on glitch capitalism um you're in mute uh no that was that was interesting um yeah i'm, I'm wondering how feasible it is you think that the, this project will sort of if you know if it's possible to go up the against these if the, the results you're, or the, the processes you're following are enough to sort of make make a dent or make a difference in what these large corporations, and, and what, what scale do you think you can see this reaching? I mean, the, uh, you're right. I mean, uh, there is always this question, especially in, uh, you know, like tactical media and so on, to, to what extent you are able to uh, actually interact and uh, uh, sort of answer to those <laughs> uh, big entities, uh, especially when they are um, not really physically located uh, anywhere near you and so on. So that it's very abstract and vague. So here in this project, we are, I mean, it's mostly a, sort of um, a symbolic way to uh, act, back, to act back, but also I guess a way to gain insight and to understand uh, how badly uh, designed are the processes they use. Because by doing the project, we also sort of uh, retro-engineered uh, how the uh, profiling are developed. 
and how um, simple and uh, low level and uh, badly uh, designed those uh, um, profiling algorithm are um, by default. So that's also, you know, like by doing this sort of reverse process, we also uh, gain and share insight on all uh, this process is made and uh, the sort of uh, weird uh, political, philosophical and cultural categorization that's a result of it. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it turns very quickly as sort of binary machine uh, uh, where the number of facets you can obtain are <laughs> quite limited. Uh, I can share a link and you, you can see for yourself. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so Rose, uh, we'll take in for the last question. Hi there. Um, I really liked your, your presentation. That was really interesting. Thank you. Um, just the idea of uh, cyborgs came up for me and just wondering if that's sort of a category or um, just if you could talk about that. Uh, uh, about cyborgs, we, we did not create a specific category for it, but in the animal uh, category at the uh, opposite end of the spectrum, opposite to the natural, we have all those like like robots or robotic creatures like Roomba, Tamagotchi, uh, and, and, and there's the big dog, of course, but we not, did not necessarily include the, 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 the human uh, per se with the technology we included human and humans in general because human beings have changed in the last uh, thousand of years for different reasons and they might change later because of uh, sensors and implants but what we we will try to show with this the, the, the robotic uh, creatures is that there's this there's sort of continuity and that's probably close to the definition of cyborgs as it appeared in the 60s by obviously by researchers at the time, we tried to de describe what uh, people living in space uh, with a certain apparatus around them were, uh, their, their life was connected to a machine and without this machine, they would not, they would not live. So this, this is probably uh, why there is this continuity and not like something totally uh, different than, 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 than animals or humans. But obviously, it's, I mean, could be interesting as well. I, I was thinking more of, um, you know, critter cams where they put mm, yeah. cameras oh, yeah, yeah. or, yeah, or yeah. robo roach. Um, so that, you know, I, I, I guess some of that is for research, but um, I guess possibilities are out there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, uh, so we'll close out here. Um, uh, before I make some closing announcements, any kind of closing thoughts from the guests today? Um, any maybe any other work that you'd like to direct uh, people here in the room or people who are watching on the YouTube channel too? Well, that's probably the the uh, the Atlas of the Anthropocene by Anna Singh and her colleagues, which could be an interesting reference. Uh, let me find the. Um, the link uh, for this, that's, that, that was not something we, the feral atlas, that's what it's called. And it's uh, a bit different than what we, what we produced, but it's probably a good, uh, uh, an interesting project for, for people interested in, in this kind of topic. I've, I've included the link in the chat. Yeah, and maybe I can add a few words, like uh, Maria and I have been uh, also sort of developing inside a project where we were serious about uh, sort of what happened next. I mean, what happened when we uh, understand and uh, acknowledge uh, this uh, stage of the Anthropocene. So we started developing sort of a research and art project uh, called um, uh, Post Growth, where you have like toolkits and different sets of prototypes that uh, sort of try to look into what are the, the options uh, beyond the fossil fuel era and this kind of intensive uh, growth and continuous growth uh, patterns that shapes our value system right now. So yeah, you can find some uh, interviews and 
early stages of project in the link I just shared on postgrowth.art. Awesome. Uh, so I'll make uh, some closing announcements in a moment, but I definitely recommend everyone check out the, the book. Uh, it will be information in the show notes. Um, and uh, Maria, Nicholas, and Nicholas, thank you so much for coming to the show today. It was, uh, it was a treat. Thanks for interest. Uh, and just to plug a couple of events that if you like this session, you might like uh, this one coming up, The Politics of Waking Up, Power and Possibility in the Fractal Age. Uh, it's on June 22nd at 12 p.m. Eastern time. And then um, The Future of the Left, uh, Noam Chomsky is coming back to the STOA with, uh, in conversation with ContraPoints, uh, and that is on uh, June 28th at 6 p.m. Eastern time, which is really be an epic epic session. So you can check out all this at thestoa.ca. So that being said, uh, everyone, thank you so much for coming to the store today. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, everyone.